Hello, welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. Viewers have long asked me to revisit some of the topics that I covered during our first season, or our first couple of seasons, really, because the technical quality of those early episodes was very different from what I'm doing now. They were shot on tape, digital tape, but still on tape, using old camcorders, which were very nice for their time, but were already outdated by the time I started doing this show. They were broadcast quality camcorders in their day, but they were old hat by the time I started this. So the, the visual quality is kind of curious looking, and also the audio, I was using cheap microphones, and then I switched to that big, almost like a broadcaster mic, and that didn't work out. And finally, I, I settled on these pretty good lavaliers that I'm using now. So the, the technical quality of some of those early episodes is kind of eh. And people have asked me to go back and, and redo some of those episodes and revisit some of the toys that I covered, because I... I I did cover a lot of heavy hitters in those early episodes. A lot of the the big names, the, the mainstays in monster collecting, like the Azrak Hanway toys, the Tomlin, Remco, so on. Some of the really big ones that people want to see. And then I said that eventually I would get around to doing that. So this is a start. Uh, this is the beginning of revisiting some of those topics. And what we're going to revisit is the Azrak Hamway Super Monsters line. And here's our good friend, the Azrak Hamway creature that you've seen many times. This is my childhood creature. I always have him on the shelf over here. This is my actual childhood creature. And you're probably tired of seeing him because I, I Show him every chance I get. Let me put you down there for now. We're going to talk a little bit about the Azrak Hanway monster line. And then we'll have a second episode that proceeds to cover the Remco monsters, which is really the same company. Azrak Hanway International is Remco. So those are two sister lines. And I thought because of uh, NECA's modern interpretations of the Remco Glow Monsters and the fact that they're, the, the NECA Monsterizer has just come out. As of this recording, I don't have mine yet, but it's, it's on route. I have tracking on it, so I should be getting it soon. I thought in honor of that, we'd re revisit the Remco line. So we'll do Azrak Hanway Super Monsters for this episode, and then we'll do the Remco monsters next, and that will bring us to the end of this season. I think those are two good shows to end on. I hope so. I hope I hope they're good. And I don't know if I'm going to spend as much time on these as I did the first time around because you know I I've, I have covered these already. So go back and watch those early episodes. I'm sure there's things I, I said in those episodes that I won't say in this one, and there's probably some toys that I showed in those episodes that I won't show in this one. So uh, even though maybe the audio-visual quality of this might be a little better, there might be some information in those early episodes that's, that's not going to be in these. I don't know. I don't know how much overlap there's going to be. As you know, I don't really prepare very much for these episodes. Uh, I just sort of wing it. So I don't know what I'm going to say, but I do want to show you this. And I, this, I don't, I don't remember if this existed when I did the earlier episode. I don't think it did. This is the first issue of Toy Ventures magazine. This is edited and published by Brian Heiler. And this is a few years old now. This, this, this has been out for a while. I think he's on issue number 12 now. This is issue number one. 
And this is really the definitive guide to Azrak Hanway super monsters. If you don't have this issue and you're interested in that topic, you really need to get this issue. There was an original Azrak Hanway catalog on eBay and I missed it. I, I, I saw it as a, a sold auction. I didn't see it when it was active. That's always the way it goes. I would have bid on that, but you know, things like that do turn up from time to time. And uh, this, this image that I just showed you, is, that is from the, the old Azrak Hanway catalog, reprinted in this, in this magazine. Here's more catalog images. But this issue is much more than catalog pictures. It goes into quite some detail about all the different monsters and variants that Azrak Hanway made back in the 1970s. A lot of thought went into this, and the colors are uh, very apropos, mirroring the color schemes that Azrak Hanway actually used in the spirit of that package design. What's something else I could show you here? Well, just a random picture here. Look at all that. So all the different variations of all, I mean, Azrak Hanway made many, many different variations of each character in this action figure line. There's so many, people often say that uh, Azrak Hanway monsters are like snowflakes no two are alike, and that's true. No, no two of these toys are exactly alike. They're all different. And this, this magazine does a great job of trying to catalog every known variant and shows all the, the both carded and loose, it shows what they look like loose. So you really need to get, if you're interested in this topic, you need to get this magazine. I don't know if it's still available from Brian or if it's sold out, but in any case, look into it, and even if you have to get it secondhand, this is a valuable resource. Now, I was on the team, there was like a think tank that went into making this, and I was on that team. And we had a private Facebook group where we spent a couple of months hashing this out and researching and comparing notes comparing photos to try to arrive at a, a body of knowledge we could more or less agree on about what was made and when it was made. And so I was, I was happy to be part of the team that researched this and put this guide together. And then Brian is the one who finally wrote and edited the whole thing and did all the graphics. Well, uh, photos, a lot of these carded photos are mine. A lot of the, and I don't own all of these anymore. Um, I own some that you'll see here, but a lot of these are older photos of toys I used to own. A lot of these, so I, I, I look at these photos and kind of miss, miss the toys I used to own. But you know, you can't keep everything forever. Um, well, so get this magazine. Ah, beating it up if you can. <sighs> Here's my good buddy. I might write, I'm currently writing a column for that magazine. Every issue for the last several issues has had a column by me. And I might write one particularly about this toy, this My Childhood Creature. I don't know that, it won't be the next issue, but that might be coming in the future. Maybe, maybe not. But this is a very important toy. I, really, I wouldn't have a monster collection today if not for this toy that I'm holding in my hand. This toy was very important. It was my favorite toy as a child. This was my buddy that I took with me everywhere. I took him to school, I took him to bed, I took him to my grandparents' house. Wherever I went, this guy, this guy went with me. 
And I had other favorite toys like my plush Bigfoots and my Kenner Alien and my Mego Hulk. I had like a little inner circle team of toy buddies that were extra special. But this was the star, this creature. He was, he was my number one little buddy as a child. And I'm happy I still have him. And the fact that I still have him is a big part of the reason why I collect toys. Because in my late teens, after not really thinking about toys for a long time, I was rummaging through some of my old toys in the basement and I, I was particularly interested in this one because it meant a lot to me as a, as a child. And I remember looking at him, like the markings on him, and I saw Azraq Hamway International. I thought, what's that? What is an Azraq Hamway International? And that started me on a journey trying to find out more about this particular toy. And one thing led to another, and that was a big part of the reason I started collecting. It was my search for knowledge about this toy. Where did this toy come from? Who, who made it? Why? What was this company? What else did they make? I had all those super monsters as a kid, but I don't know if I mentally put it together that all these different toys were made by the same company. I think I knew all the action figures were, but I don't know if as a kid, like all these things we're going to show you, I don't know if I understood that this was all AHI, Azra Kenway International. I don't know if I did. I, I knew Mego. I knew Kenner. So I knew some companies like that. I knew Aurora. So some companies I, I could tell, like this is an Aurora kit. This is Fun Dimensions. This is Kenner. This is Fisher Price. This is Mego. This is not Mego. I knew that about some things. I don't know, because I was very young when these came out, these Azra Hamway monsters. I don't know if, I, at that point, I was really thinking about toy companies. So that was a, a journey of discovery in my late teens, trying to find out about this company and what else did they make. And, and, and at that point, I realized that there was something very unique about this line, this particular line. There were not just a whole bunch of really serious looking universal monster toys. There was something that stood out about this line. So why? How did this happen? Why, why did this company happen to make these toys? instead of, let's say, Mego or Mattel or some other company? How did it come to be that this company made these toys? So that, this particular figure really started me on that road of discovery that led to learning about other toy companies and what, what had been made, what was available, and so on. And that started to lay the foundation for toy collecting in general. Let's look at some toys. We'll start with this. Azraq Hanway International was like a lot, of, a lot of their competitors at that at that time. They were a New York-based company, and since we have this guide, why don't we use it instead of just being off the cuff? Might as well. We have this handy guide here, so let me just read from this. Azraq Hanway International or as we refer to it, AHI, I'll, I'll say something about that in a minute, were the efforts, so this company, were the efforts of Marvin Azrak and Ezra Hamway. They began in the 1960s selling low-cost toys and inflatable novelties. They rose to fame in the 1970s with the acquisition of popular licenses and later purchased Remco toys. The AHI brand was retired in the mid-1980s, and all subsequent toys solely featured the Remco name. 
the combined company was sold in 1997 to Jack's Pacific. And that's a company that we've talked about before. And I once, in the 1990s, tried to talk to Marvin Azrak and Ezra Hanway, and I called them, and they both hung up on me. They were like, who's this? Get out of here. They hung up. Um, that was pretty much my, my luck in the 90s, trying to, as a toy nerd, trying to contact these people. Now, you heard me say AHI, and you heard me say AHI, and I don't know in the halls of Azrak Hanway how they said the name of their company. They probably said AHI if, if they said initials like that. Uh, but in the 90s, everyone said either AHI or AHI, like the tuna. And I hated that AHI. I said AHI. And I thought that sounded fun. It sounded like something you want to collect, AHI. I'm an AHI collector. And the way they printed their logo on the toys, it looked like a high, because they had a lowercase i. So I still say a high, and a lot of particularly 90s era collectors, I started formally collecting in 1989. A lot of, you'll hear a lot of 90s era collectors say a high, and I'll st I still say a high. It's fun, it's cute. Uh, I don't know. I doubt that that's how they said it. They probably said A-H-I. But for the rest of this episode, I'm going to unashamedly say A-H-I. I'm going to call these A-H-I toys. But just know, it's Azra Kenway International. And in all likelihood, inside the company, they, they probably said A-H-I. And most more recent collectors that are more and more contemporary will say AHI. The old school dinosaurs like me will say AHI. We've got a lot of crinkly bags here. Maybe Billy will show up finally. He was on the steps over here a little while ago. I sure wish he would say hi. He hasn't been up on the table in a long time. Billy's my cat. He used to be on the show all the time. Almost, well not every episode, but like every other episode he would jump up here for a while and I'd pet him and he'd jump down. But he doesn't do that anymore. And it's a shame because I think everyone really liked seeing him. Okay, let's let's build up to the action figures. Now, as a kid, I don't remember if the action figures, if I saw those first, or if I saw the rubber jigglers, if I saw the bendums. Um, but because I think the action figures are the, the coolest part of all this, we'll save those for last. We'll build up to that. Now, I used to have carded bendums, Dracula, Wolfman, and this Frankenstein, and I had a few carded King Kongs. I had multiples of those. I was army building carded King Kongs. Now I just have the carded Frankenstein in, in one carded King Kong. So I used to have more, uh, I used to have more of all this. I used to have more than 20 carded AI action figures, the super monsters. I had like 22 or some number like that, carded ones, all different. And I don't have that anymore. You'll see how many I have. I have, it's whittled down quite a bit now. The Azurite Camway line began in 1974. A lot of the copyrights will say 1973, although this card here says 1974. And for a long time, I thought they were introduced in 73 because that's the date that's on the toys, most of them, not not this one. But no, they they, they came out in 19, 1974. And here's an example of a carded Ahai Bendem's Frankenstein. Now, uh, what is a Bendem's? Well, it's rubber with wires in it. 
So it's not an articulated action figure, but it will hold a pose. You can bend it and it'll, it will hold its pose. You can see he's really cute. They're all very cute. All these bendums are adorable. Look at that color scheme, because you'll see these similar color schemes come back again and again. There's a very consistent look. Even though there's all these variations in these toys, there's an overall aesthetic uh, color scheme that comes back again and again, even across different formats, like the Bentons versus the Jigglers versus the action figures. Now look at this kind of Son of Frankenstein illustration. He's got like a vest, like Son of Frankenstein. You see the famous Ahai castle back there. You'll see more of that. Official world famous super monsters. They were trying to tie this in with Migo's official world's greatest superheroes. So basically these were knockoffs. They were Migo knockoffs. Trying to cash in on the similarity to Migo. There's that A high logo. And all of these are licensed by Universal Studios. I don't have the carded Dracula bendum, so I can't look at the copyright on that. But if if there's any that are not copyrighted, it would be that one. All the rest are going to be copyrighted. The Dracula action figure is not copyrighted because if you've been following monster toy history, you know the situation with Dracula and Bela's son, Bela Jr., the attorney. It'd be interesting to have him on. He's still alive. I've met him. <sighs> but because of his efforts to defend licensing rights for his father's likeness, a lot of Dracula merchandise is not licensed. It doesn't have a universal license. And then for a while it did, and then it didn't after that. Because of the different court cases over the years. There's the King Kong Bendy. So like I said, I, I used to have multiples of this, these carded King Kong Bendums, and I just have this one. That's not a sticker, that's printed on, that Kresge price sticker. It's not really a sticker, it's printed onto the card. And I know that these were not only sold at Kresge. In fact, I'm not sure if I actually bought any of these at Kresge as a child. Got a little Fay Ray in his hand. And I love the Ahai Kong artwork particularly. It just has this beautiful RKO look. A lot of Kong merchandise doesn't look anything like the RKO Kong, but the Ahai stuff does. I was going to do an episode. I was thinking of making it the finale to the season where I was going to go to the stores of my childhood where I, as a child, where my parents bought me and my grandparents bought me all this stuff. And I would see what the stores are like now and I would go to the aisles and say, okay, this is the aisle where I would see the Bendums for sale or whatever. And I'd talk about my memories. But all the, I, I did some location scouting and all those stores are so different now. Now the one where I bought most of the Bendums, when I say I bought, I mean my parents bought, that still is a store. That still is a retail store. And I was able to go through the aisles and find the spot where I remember the Bendems being. And I, so I could do that one. But other ones like the Kresge store, and I remember it being Kmart when I was a kid, but maybe it was Kresge, um, where I bought most of the action figures, the Super Monsters action figures, and where I bought all my Tomlin monsters. That is now a, a private storage facility. So that's not even a store anymore. 
Uh, and some of the other stores are like, one's a smoothie shop and one's a sporting goods store. They look nothing like they used to. So I couldn't, I couldn't go in there and say, here's the store today and, and walk through the aisles and say, here's where the super monsters were. I couldn't do the kind of episode I envisioned in my head because the, the stores are just, they've changed too much. The entire footprint's different. Everything's different. But I do remember, uh, it was a store called Knights. And I remember exactly what aisle these were in. It was a, like a counter display. I remember the shelf. I remember these being in that counter display. And it was a, some kind of a, you know, a, the display would have like a cardboard backdrop. Um, I remember thumbing through them and, and buying them out of that. And as a kid, the only Bendems I did not have, the, the only one I didn't have was the Wolfman. I never had a Wolfman Bendem as a kid. I had all the rest, and I still have all my childhood Bendems, but I'm not, the ones I'm gonna show you are not my childhood ones. Because I have my childhood ones like stapled shut in, in these plastic bags, they're stapled to make sure I never take them out. So uh, I decided if, if I was that serious about not removing them from the bags, I would just not bother. Uh, so all of these are ones that I collected as an adult. Here's a closer shot without the card of Frankenstein. And you can see that's a pretty good Frankenstein, isn't it? I mean, it really looks like Boris Karloff. You might say Glenn Strange. I think it's Boris Karloff. Well, look at that. For a rubber figure this size, I mean, look at my fingers, how small it is. That's really good. That is really good. Look at his cute little hands. And all of these took inspiration from the Aurora model kits. The Aurora monster model kits were introduced in the 60s, but they were reissued in the 70s in, as glow kits, glow-in-the-dark model kits. And as a kid, I never knew that they had been sold in the 60s. I thought the 70s kits were the original versions. I didn't, I didn't know until I was an adult. I started collecting. I didn't know about the long box kits from the 60s. I thought the square boxes were the only ones that were ever made. And that's what I remember as a child. I remember the... Uh, I had all of those, the square, Aurora Square glow-in-the-dark kits sold in the square boxes. And these toys take inspiration from those model kits. Oh, well, let's see. Let's show Dracula. And he should have a red cape. I don't have one that has a red cape. Of course, when I had a carded one, that one had a red cape because it was on a card, but he's not really focusing very well but this loose one does not. Because the red cape, it's all rubber, and it has a band that goes around the neck, and that band always breaks if it's loose. It's hard to keep that intact. But you know, here again, given it's just a little rubber toy, that's actually a pretty good Bela-style Dracula. I've seen a lot worse. I've seen Dracula toys that were supposedly licensed by the Lugosi estate that didn't look as much like Bela Lugosi as this. And especially my childhood one really looks like Bela Lugosi. I'm not going to show that one because like I say he's all stapled shut in that bag, but no, no two of these look exactly alike. Some look a lot more like Bela than others. But this one looks pretty much like Bela, I think. So just imagine a red cape. It's all red on both sides, a red rubber cape behind him.
and um, when I did the first episode, I don't think I had, no, I didn't have the card one anymore. It's been a long time since I s sold that carded one. I'll never have any more carded bendems, I'm sure. They're just, they're too expensive and they're too hard to find. I never had a carded mummy or creature bendems. And that's why I sold the other two because I, I knew I would never get a complete set because the creature and the mummy are just impossible to find carded. They would be, multi-thousands of dollars carded and I was never going to pay that much. I don't remember the last time I saw one of those for sale. It's been years and years. I remember back in the 90s I had one opportunity to get those on cards. And I gave it my best shot, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't, it was going to cost more than I could possibly spend, even back then. So if there was ever a point where I, I might have had a chance to get them, it was back then in the 90s. Here's the Wolfman, and I never had this one as a child. This is the only one I never had as a kid. He kind of looks like a hippie Wolfman. He kind of looks like Curse of Bigfoot, too. Like a hippie, curse of Bigfoot wolfman. And like the Aurora kit, he's, he's not wearing a shirt. He's got a rope belt. Torn pants. Very Aurora inspired. But also a very unique take on that character. This, this one does not really look like the Universal Lonchini Jr. character. This is a more original take a more generic one. But you do, I think you do see the Aurora kit reflected in it. He's got black hair all the way around. Why? And I think that that's part of what makes him look unique is that his hair on his head is a different color than the rest of his hair. He's got that black head of hair and that black beard, kind of like me. I guess he's Coffin Wolfman. Wolf to Kaisho. So that's a unique take on the Wolfman. And no, none of Ahai's different versions of the Wolfman look the same. Each time they presented this character, it looks completely different. But this is a very unique one in that you just don't see Wolfman toys that have that beard, hair and beard that looks different from the rest of the body. The Lincoln Wolfman kind of has that look. The Lincoln Wolfman has kind of that hippie look with, with a beard. But even then, the Lincoln Wolfman has a brown body and his hair is brown, so that they, they goes together. This, this Wolfman's unique in that the hair is black. And the rest of them is brown. This is a mummy. And he does look like the Cheney Jr. mummy. Now this particular example, you, you don't really see the likeness as well on, on this one, but my childhood one has a very Cheney-esque look. And I used to have, as a collector, I had another loose one that I guess I sold over the years. And he looked pretty good. I think he was dark. He was much darker than this. I've seen a lot of different color variations on this. I've seen mummies that are almost black. They're so dark, they have so much paint. And I s I've seen at least one that had colors that seemed like they were trying to mimic the Aurora glow kit box art where the 
head looked like maybe it was yellowish and there was a bluish color on the body and it was very unique looking and it was an original paint job it wasn't a custom thing so there's been a lot of different variants and the one I the one I had as a kid and still have is almost white and this one's also almost white I mean it's, it's gray but there's not a lot of paint on him and the other one I the, the other loose one I had was almost black it had so much paint it was so heavily painted so that's the mummy obviously based on the Cheney Jr. mummy As a kid, I really liked the mummy. I was especially fond of all the a height mummy toys, but particularly the Bendham mummy. I, I played with him a lot. I'd bury him, and I'd have the adventure people dig him up. So I got a lot of play value out of the mummy. And if you like crinkly plastic, this is the episode for you. Now I'm showing you two creatures because they are different. Obviously this is the creature from the Black Lagoon. Let's do one at a time. I don't know if you can see the difference on camera, but they, they are made of different kinds of rubber. This, is, this one is a little darker. It has a more of a, a pearly, pearlescent texture, and, and this one is more drab or opaque, and this is a little bit lighter colored. So this has a, like a shinier look, and this is a more drab look. And the, te and the feel of the rubber is different, too. They feel different. And the one I had as a kid was definitely this version. I still have him. I think you can, even on the camera, I think you can see that they are different. There's a difference in these things. And they both have their, their fins on the back, a lot of detail on the back. And you can see they, they put some thought into it. That's a good amount of detail back there. So these are really nice creature toys, really nice Gill Man toys. And as I said, Finding one of these on a card, forget it. There's, I don't know, I'm, you can probably count on one hand the number of collectors that would have a Bendham's creature on a card and probably have a couple of fingers left over. And it's the same thing with the mummy. Not many people have a mummy. And it used to be said that the Bendham's mummy was the hardest one to find on a card. I, I don't know about that. I think that they're both so rare. It's hard to say one is really rarer than the other. They're both impossible. Okay, now, since we were dealing with rubber bendems, let's continue with rubber and we'll show you the jigglers next. Here are the jigglers, the rubber jigglers. I took them out of their bags ahead of time to save you the pain of hearing the plastic crinkle. Well, let's start with this big old creature. He's very jiggly. He's very translucent. I don't know if that really comes through on camera, but you can practically see through him. And here's his card, or his tag, I should say.
and he looks like he's based on a still from Revenge of the Creature. Definitely has a revenge look, Revenge of the Creature look. He has little feet, and they all have little feet like that. I don't know why they didn't give him big flippery feet like you would expect. His big hands. And of course, like any good 70s monster toy, he's got blood. Big red lips and blood on his hands. I wish I could shine a light behind his fins so you could just see how translucent he is. And he's a, a pretty big weighty jiggler. He's got a, some weight to him and he's he's large. Much larger than a Ben Cooper jiggler. Ben Cooper jigglers are you know, like so big. He's a uh, uh, a good inch or so taller than your average Ben Cooper jiggler. Although the Ben Cooper Frankenstein is pretty tall. But he's a pretty, as you can see with my hand, he's pretty big. A little bigger than average for a, a 70s monster jiggler. There are certainly big jigglers, particularly the Italian jigglers. There are some big ones that were made in Italy. And I've shown you some of their large jigglers over the years, large monster jigglers. Now he's got some weight. He's actually very dense, much more dense than that creature. This is the wolf man. And once again, a, a very different take from that Bendem. This almost looks like Chewbacca, but it was made before Chewbacca. This is a 1974 toy. You can, however, see the Aurora kit influence again. Just wearing jeans and a rope belt, no shirt. Of course he has blood on his hands. Why he doesn't look more like the Universal Wolfman, I don't know. It's, he's definitely Universal licensed, for sure. Can we see, his, there's his tag. He's a little smaller than the creature. These were all different sizes, even, like if you had 10 Wolfman Jigglers next to each other, or 10 Creature Jigglers, they'd all be slightly different sizes. There's a lot of variation in these. And I've seen, I've seen very drastic differences in the Wolfman Jiggler. And I've, I've owned many different ones that were taller, shorter, there's a lot of variance. Here is the mummy. And no two mummies are going to look alike. The one I had as a child was milky white. And I do have one like that today as a collector. It's not my childhood one, but it looks just like it. And it's just absolute milk white. Very little paint except uh, just a few details that are painted and the rest is milky white. And that's the one, that's the what my childhood one looked like. And then I've seen examples that are practically black, that they have, they have so much paint. I have one of those too. And I have one that's molded in brown rubber. This one's in off-white rubber, but I have one that's molded in brown. It's almost as brown as the Wolfman. So there's a lot of variation in these mummies particularly. And again, he's got the blood. And that's because the Aurora model kit artwork, even going back into the 60s, the James Bama original artwork from the 60s, but certainly the 70s glow kit artwork, the, the monsters often have blood on their hands in that art, and, and the mummy certainly does. And that became a trope with monster merchandise at this time. The, the monsters, of course, would have 
blood all over them. Poor mummy has a bloody eye. And that's because the Aurora artwork, particularly the glow kit art, had blood streaming from his blind eye. Which the, I mean, the, the movie mummy, the universal movie mummy, never had that. He never had any blood like that. This tag. Yeah, I'm trying to show you the answer at Camway Haunted Mansion in there. He's a good sized jiggler, too. And there's variations in these mummies. I'm, even the ones I have, some of them are bigger than others. That white one is a little bigger than the, than the, the other ones. And that brown one is a little bigger. There's a lot of variation in these things. Now this Frankenstein, oh, he is so oily, whoa. He's practically oozing, he is so oily. I mean, he is like you just plucked him off the assembly line. He is oily, oily, oily. Very jiggly, very oily. And as you can see, that, that color scheme from the Bendems carries over. He's got the same colors, the same blue boots and blue shirt, same kind of green color in his head, his hands, same style with the costume. And of course, it's all black like a Frankenstein ought to be. This is long before the horrible green jacket before that nonsense started. This is back in the era where the monsters looked like they were supposed to look. And you can see his tag here. And uh, I have more Frankensteins, rubber Frankensteins than any other character. I have multiples on all these, but I have more Frankensteins than the rest. And I've sold a few sets over the years. So I used to have a, just a ton of these jigglers, and uh, including multiple tagged sets. I think this is my last tagged set. I don't think I have all four of these, uh, another four examples of these tagged. I have another tagged Frankenstein, and I have a, I think I have another tagged mummy maybe? I don't think I have another tag creature. I think there's, out of the four, I think there's, there might only be two that I have additional tagged examples of. But I used to have three or four tagged sets. And just over the years, I've whittled it down. <sighs> so this is probably my premier tagged set if I was gonna put a set in a museum. I guess this is, the ones I'm showing you here would be the ones I'd choose. And I had all of these as a child. I had all these jigglers as a child. And I remember really, I really liked the creature's big mouth. I would stick my little pinky finger in his mouth and I'd kind of just hold, hold him by my finger so he'd be like biting my finger. And I'd wiggle him around. I, don't, I wouldn't do that now. I'd probably split him if I tried that now. But when I was a little kid, that worked just fine. And I, I have a lot of memories of playing with these rubber jigglers as a kid. They were important to me. And I had all four as a kid. Now, before we leave the world of jigglers, let's look at uh, one other jiggler. Ahai also made a King Kong jiggler. And let's see. Yeah, you're gonna have to take him out of here so you can see this card properly. Take the card out. So there's the backing card. And it has 
wires that hold the toy in place. And this is from this was at Toys R Us. And there's that great RKO style artwork that I love with the AI con toys. And I'll I'll show you a better image of this guy in a second, but there's the jiggler and So here's one without the card. It's kind of blurry. You see he's got a little fairy, which is molded right off the Aurora model kit. The Aurora King Kong has a fairy, and it's about the same, si well, yeah, it's about the same size as that. So they just took the Aurora kit and just made a mold of it. But all, all the features of this Kong are based on that Aurora kit. It looks like the Aurora kit, the, the head and everything. And this one has a tag. With a really cute little King Kong image. These were sold loose tagged and they were sold on that card. And from what I've seen, the carded ones do not have a tag. Like the one I just showed you, that one does not have a tag. And I don't think I've seen a carded one that had a tag. So if it has a tag, it was sold loose with the tag. And if it doesn't, well, I mean, if it doesn't have a tag, maybe it just lost its tag. But if it was sold on a card, it probably never had a tag. And let me see if I can see any difference. I mean, I don't really see a difference in the carded version and the tagged version. They look like they're about the same. And as far as I know, that's all the, the licensed monster jigglers that Ahai made. And this is licensed. That's RKO. The, the Ahai King Kong toys are licensed through RKO which is not something you see anymore. And I think that's part of why they're so cool. They're not just generic King Kong and they're not like Universal King Kong or uh, Turner Broadcasting Licensed or some, something like that. They're not Legendary Pictures King Kong. They're RKO King Kong and I think that's important. That's the licensing on these things. This is 1973 RKO General Inc. Nineteen seventy three, but like I said, these toys really came out in seventy four. As as far as anybody knows, that seems to be when they actually hit stores. I really love the A High King Kong stuff and um him aside over here for a second. Okay, let's show you this one. Here's a sparking walker. Ahai made three of these. They made the creature, they made King Kong, and they made an unlicensed Godzilla, which you're going to see. This is the King Kong, and there again, there's that great artwork I like. Official, official King Kong, little walker. Little sparking walker. So you would wind these up, and they would walk, and they'd shoot sparks out of their mouth. Little sparks would come out. And I would turn off the lights and watch them walk around sparking <laughs> through their mouth. Now 
Now with these walkers, I've got the dinosaur and I've got this Kong. I don't have the creature. There was oh, one time where there was a guy that had a creature on a card, a sparking walker, a hype, and I think he wanted by the time, after talking to him back and forth, I think we got down to $1,400, which today would be a good price for that. Um, at the time, it still seemed kind of high, but then hit the bubble came off. And once the bubble came off, he was much more agreeable to the price, but at that point, I didn't want it. He's like, you should have sold it to me when the bubble is still on. He dropped it or something, and the bubble came off. And then that, I stopped talking to him about it after that. Uh, but uh, if that bubble had not come off, I probably would have bought it back then for that price. And it would have been a good buy, because now I don't think you could buy one for that price now. I think that that would be cheap in today's market. You know, rel rel relatively speaking, there's nothing cheap about $1,400, but I don't think you could get one for that price now. But that's a shame, because then I'd have all three on cards. Now that we saw that, let's see the dinosaur. Well, let's just take him out this way. Okay, here is the Rex dinosaur. Obviously, he's Godzilla. Ahai didn't get a license for Godzilla. Looks like he's on Monster Zero's home planet. I guess that's Planet X. Monster Zero comes from Planet X. Well, of course, that's Godzilla. Obviously, he's supposed to be Godzilla. But they did not get a Toho license, so they released him as Rex Dinosaur. As a kid, I just assumed this was Godzilla. I didn't know until I was an adult, and I saw this card. Really, until I collected him and bought this card, I didn't know that Ahai didn't call it Godzilla. As a kid, I just I assumed it was Godzilla. When I played with him, he was Godzilla. And I guess, because I, I I'm sure I couldn't read when I, my parents bought this for me. I couldn't read yet. So I didn't know what that said. I just thought it was Godzilla. So it wasn't until I was an adult that I discovered that, in fact, it was not licensed like the rest of the characters. It was an unlicensed Godzilla. It was called Rex Dinosaur. And here, well, okay, I, I have not mentioned the name, the name Soma yet, but it's it's time to mention it. Here is a bagged example of that toy, but it's not exactly the same. It's not identical. I mean, it's more or less identical, but not 100%. It doesn't say Ahai anywhere on this package. And here is a loose one. Also doesn't say Ahai, doesn't say after I can't wait on it anywhere. And now here's a creature, which looks pretty much like the, the one Ahai put out, but it's not exactly the same. It's virtually identical. Let's see if I can get holding steady here. It's virtually identical, but not 100%. The 
official Ahai one has feet molded in green. And I think this key is a little different too. But he's not, now, as a kid I did have the real Ahai version. I don't know where he is now. I can't believe I would have thrown him away, but I, I haven't found him. But I mean, it looks pretty much like this. Imagine this with pla green plastic feet and you pretty much got it. So, but what are these almost but not quite a high sparking walkers? And there's a King Kong like this too. These were made by Soma. And they, Soma kept putting these out for years and years. And sometimes you'll see counter display boxes full of them. And those are cool things to own. I'd like to own one of those, but they're not a high. They look like a high, but they're not a high. And those counter display boxes have artwork that looks like that. Those are made by Soma. And Soma was a Hong Kong based company. It was a, a factory company in Hong Kong that manufactured toys for other companies, like U.S. companies, like Azraq Hamway International. Azraq Hamway contracted with Soma in Hong Kong to produce all of the Super Monsters toys. So all the action figures, certainly the plastic stuff, the action figures, the sparking walkers, probably the rubber stuff too, but I, I don't know about that. But definitely all the plastic toys were made by Soma. And then Soma continued to make some of this stuff after their relationship with Azra Kenway ended. They might have had some go out the back door that even while they were still working with Azra Kenway, they might have made some that didn't that were not officially through their Azra Kenway contract. But definitely after the contract ended with Azra Kenway, they kept making some of the action figures and the sparking walkers, and maybe some of the other stuff. So there's AHI or AHI monster toys that were not actually made officially by AHI, and they don't have the Azra Hamway copyright on them, and they don't have universal copyrights on them. And when you see that, you're looking at a Soma toy. I mean, all of these are really Soma because Soma is the company that actually manufactured them, but they manufactured them under contract with Azra Kenway. They manufactured them for Azra Kenway. And that's an interesting part of the toy world, this whole Hong Kong scene and all these companies that, that we don't really know about. We know about Miko and Kenner and Hasbro and Mattel, but we, we don't know about these Hong Kong-based companies that were the ones that actually made this stuff these U.S. companies contracted with these Hong Kong companies, and the Hong Kong companies were the ones with the factories where they actually produced these things. And Soma was one of those companies in Hong Kong, and they actually made this stuff for Azra Kenway, and in some cases continued making it beyond their relationship with Azra Kenway. So you'll see virtually the same stuff with the Azra Kenway logo and without the Azra Kenway logo. And when you see it without the Azra Kenway logo, you're, you're looking at a Soma toy. Something made by Soma. And I'm assuming what I'm gonna show you here, these must have been Soma products. I've never seen any indication that Azra Kenway put these out. These are pencil heads. They're not erasers. They're the same PVC as the action figure heads, but they're made to go on pencils. On the, uh, they're pencil toppers. Pencil toppers. There's a Wolfman. This is your first look on this episode of the Wolfman action figure head. That's basically it. That's the action figure head. But it's a pencil topper. It's meant to stick on a pencil. And they made four of these. Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, Mummy. 
did not make a creature as far as anybody knows. And I don't think there are any Soma creature figures. I mean, there's a Sparking Walker, yes, but no action figures. I don't, I don't think there's, no one's ever identified a, well, l let's look at this for the moment. This is the Dracula and he's green. And none of the action figure heads are like that. But it's the same sculpt as the action figure head. Or at least one of the one of the sculpts used for the action figure head. Pretty cool. I like him. It would have been neat if they had made an action figure with this head, and I'm sure you could certainly customize an Ahai Dracula figure and stick this head on it. It wouldn't be too hard to fix something at the neck joint to make that stick in place. That's a pencil topper. And I think that's a pretty good Bela style Dracula. It looks like the Aurora kit. It's obviously modeled off the Aurora model kit. So there's a Soma pencil topper. Where did I put my Wolfman? Well, let me clean this up and uh, then we'll start looking at action figures. But that's, we're all building up now to the action figures. So we'll put these away and then when we come back, we'll look at the plastic action figures. Whoa! I've jumped forward in time two weeks. I didn't intend that, but you know, when you use the I Ching, it's kind of tricky. You never quite know where you're gonna end up. So I thought I was gonna jump ahead a few minutes. I jumped ahead two weeks. So now we're two weeks in the future. This is future Raymond. We don't have flying cars yet, unfortunately. It's only two weeks, so not a lot change. I, change my shirt that's about it but the reason that we've jumped ahead is because I wanted to show you something that I did not have a couple weeks ago I'll show it to you first and then talk about it and then I'll show you the item again so that is an Azraq Hamway King Kong water gun there's that great RKO style artwork that I love. And this is licensed 1973 RKO. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this and other Azurite Hamway water guns. Now, when I shot the episode two weeks ago, I had a little section where I talked about water guns. And I said I, I'd never owned an Ahai water gun. They made three. King Kong, Frankenstein, and the creature from the Black Lagoon. And that creature water gun is one of the most sought after monster toys of all time. It's, I think by now, eclipsed the action figure, the carded action figure, as uh, the most desired creature item in the Azurite Hamway line. I think that water gun is now the ultimate holy grail. Now, I, I like the water gun, but I was never, I never liked it enough to pay what it took to get one. Even back in the 90s, they were very rare and they cost a lot of money. 30 years ago, they were expensive and rare. And now, you could easily pay thousands of dollars for a loose one. I don't know if a carded one has even turned up. I'm not sure. I don't think one has. So there, I don't know if a carded, a carded Ahai creature water gun exists. But there are loose ones and they can go for thousands. The Frankenstein's also very rare. It does not sell for, for nearly the same price range as the creature. There's at least one carded Frankenstein water gun that I know of. There's probably a couple more, but there's one particular that I know of. 
And it, you know, it sells high, but it doesn't sell for anything like the Creature. The Creature water gun, and I don't have one to show you, the Creature water gun uh, looks a lot like the, uh, the wide waist Creature. The head on that, I mean, looks just like that. Only it's a water gun. Now the King Kong water gun is the most common of the three. There was a find of carded ones several years ago. So that's why you see some of them out there and, and this one's unpunched. So you, you, you can find King Kong, car, even carded as right can King Kong water guns out there because of this find from several years back. I think there were, there were maybe two dozen carded Kong guns, something like that, and one Frankenstein, which is the carded one I was referring to was in that find, but no creatures. So these are somewhat available. They're not cheap. They're still expensive, but they're not impossible like the creature or nearly impossible like the Frankenstein. But I never owned any of these back in the day when I was a kid. I've never owned any Kong creature or Frankenstein. As an adult collector, I've never owned an AHI water gun until now. So after I shot that episode, the rest of the episode you've been watching, it really bothered me that I didn't have a water gun to show you. I felt like there was a gaping hole in the collection. I, th I thought, I've, I've got to show you a water gun. So this one was available and it was priced right. It was a nice condition, very crisp card, unpunched, beautiful bubble, just a little bit of you know, crinkly here or there, not, not bad. Everything's nice. Price, you know, it, it could have been twice as much. Uh, so the price was not bad. Um, so I, I thought, well, I haven't bought a vintage a high monster item in years and years. Why not break the fast and buy this so I can get it into this video, at least have some representation of the water guns. I can't show you a creature, I can't show you a Frankenstein, but I can show you the Kong. And another reason I particularly wanted this, I've talked about how I like the, the Ahai Kong products particularly. I like King Kong, the movie, a lot, the 33 movie. But now with this, I've got the complete Ahai Kong experience. I've got the carded Sparking Walker. I've got the carded Bendem. I've got the carded Jiggler. I've got the tagged Jiggler. So I've got, uh, am I forgetting one? I don't know. I don't think so. But I've got all of the Kong products, the Bendems, the Jiggler tagged and carded, the Sparking Walker carded, and I've got now the Water Gun carded. So I've got all the Ahai Kong products either mint in package or mint with tag. And you can't say that about the Creature or Frankenstein or you know any other character. Uh, I can't say that I've got every package variant, every product variant of any other particular Ahai character. But I can say that about Kong. So I've got every single Ahai Kong product that I know of in mint condition in the package, if it came in a package. And these water guns were sold loose and carded like this. The, definitely the creature, if you find it at all, it's gonna be loose. I don't know if a carded creature has surfaced on the collector market? I'm not sure. I, I don't remember one being for sale. I don't remember seeing one in anyone's collection, so I, I don't know. But there are some loose ones out there. 
and the Frankenstein is also very rare. Not as rare as the creature, certainly loose. You can certainly get a loose Frankenstein. It's not going to be cheap, but you can get one. And the Kong is, if you want to use the word easy, it's the easiest one to find. But you know, I don't, I don't know if there are, are very many loose Kongs, Kong water guns out there. I think because of that find, when you, when you find the Kong water gun, it's probably going to be on a card. And you can see that sculpt very much like the Aurora model kit. Obviously model off of that. There's his little stopper where you put the water in. And I'll have to look. I can't really see this writing with my terrible eyesight, so I'll look at it when I'm editing this and see what that says. There's some writing on there, too. And I believe this trigger comes in two colors. I don't know if the other one is black or brown. I, I know it's darker, but I, I don't know if it's black or brown. But I do think there are two colors for that trigger. And this artwork is based on a famous still. Willis O'Brien's King Kong model standing with the... Uh, New York skyline below him, and all the lightning. Look at this hand-drawn King Kong with these funky 3D letters, how that's drawn. I like that. Everything's hand-drawn on these Azraq Hanway cards, even official. I mean, that's obviously hand-drawn. Looks like lettering for a cartoon. And they call it water gun. They don't call it water pistol. So there it is. That's I, I, I'm happy I bought this. I haven't bought a vintage AHI item in years and years and years. I mean, gosh, it must be at least a decade, probably longer than that. But this is the first time in years that I've added a new AHI item to my collection. I'm not saying I'm going to start buying AHIs again. But... Uh, it's nice just to add something significant to the collection for the first time in a long time. Well, I think I've handled this enough. I, I need to put this away so it doesn't get damaged. There it is. So I've got, I didn't think I was going to have any water guns in this video, but I've, I've now included the water guns in the video. So we've got every, well, every Azraq Hanway category except the flashlights. I don't have any flashlights, so I can't show you those. But we've got, we're going to see the action figures in a minute. And we have the Jigglers and the Bendoms and the Sparking Walkers and the Pencil Toppers. And now the water guns. We've got the whole crew. Okay, now let's go back to the I Ching. Some people will know what that reference is, but most of you probably don't. And we'll travel through time, and these will magically disappear from the table. And we'll go back, back in time, two weeks, and we'll talk about the super monsters action figures. Are you ready? We're going back in time. Here we go. Abracadabra. We're back. It's cleaned off. Now let's talk about these action figures. And of course these are always the the main attraction when you're talking about Azra Canway monsters. Put you right there. <laughs> oh, 
those are the two creatures. We'll save those for last, of course. Let's see, what do we got here? Yep, back to the plastic bag again. Well, let's get right to it. Here's a Frankenstein. There is an Azrak Hanway International Super Monsters Frankenstein. And this would be the kind that's generally called the colored body because these variants have bodies that match, well, they're, they're bodies that are color coded to match the character. And you can see there that he has there we go, he has green hands. But it's not just the hands, it's the entire body that's green. You'll have to trust me, his entire body is definitely green. Even though you can't see that. And with this variant, all the cards are different. With this style, they have these little inset images. On some of them, the, the image fills the entire back. And of course, this artwork is based on the Aurora Glow Kit artwork, which in turn was based on the 60s James Bama Aurora artwork. But this is especially based on the glow kit art. And there's the classic Azrak Hanway Super Monsters haunted castle with the bats. These pink cards are iconic among monster collectors and they're they look like this because they're imitating a card style known as a Kresge card. Mego figures were sold on cards that look a lot like this. And even though those cards were not necessarily sold at Kresge, they've become known as the Kresge cards. And I'm not Amigo superhero expert. For years, people just assumed any Amigo superhero that was sold on a card that looked like this was sold at Kresge stores. But I know that's not that's not the prevailing thought at this time. And I don't know if I don't know if none of those cards were sold at Kresge or some were and some weren't. I don't know what the story is on those, but they're still, collectors still generally call them Kresge cards, whether that's accurate or not. And these cards were not all sold at Kresge. Some were. Some actually have Kresge logos printed on them. I don't have any like that. And others have price stickers from different stores. I used to have one from Disneyland had a price sticker, had a Disneyland logo on it. And I've had all kinds of, I've had price stickers from all kinds of stores on these things. Like I said, I, I had two dozen of them at one point. But this, um, the ones I have now are all, except for the creatures, they're all from, well, almost all of them are from this colored body variant. So the Frankenstein has a green body, Mummy has a yellow body, Dracula has a red body. 
and Wolfman has a brown body. And of course the creatures are the creatures, they have green bodies. But even though those colors don't make a lot of sense with the characters, they are color-coded to match the character. Dracula, it's blood, so he has red, he has a red body. Mummy's yellow because of the Aurora glow kit art that depicts him with a yellow head and yellow hands. Wolfman has a brown body because he's the Wolfman. Of course, he's, he's always depicted in monster merchandise as being brown. Now, wolves are not really brown. They're gray or silver or black. But the Wolfman, always, he's always depicted as having that grizzly bear brown look. And Frankenstein's green because, you know, Frankenstein's always, in, in classic merchandise, he's always depicted as being green. And that's the, so I have that set of the four color-coded monsters. And when I, I, I had other ones, I sold them. I decided if I was going to keep one set, that's the set I would keep. I liked that set, the color-bodied ones, but also they most closely matched the wide waist creature that you'll see. The this is known as the wide waist creature. Now there's another set called painted hands variant that's almost identical to the colored body versions, but instead of colored bodies, they have tan bodies. Although I think the Wolfman still has a brown body, but. Frankenstein, for instance, would have green paint on his hand. Dracula has red paint. Mummy has yellow paint. And Wolfman has brown paint on his hands, even though I think they're brown anyway. And I know that the wide waist creature corresponds to that set. And as far as I know, if there was a creature in stores alongside these colored body versions, it would have been this creature. And the creature is pictured on the cards. The thin waist creature corresponds to what's known as the hard head set. And you'll see at least one of those in a second. Hard head Azurak Hanway monsters are com look completely different. And the hard head set really is my favorite set. They're probably the most serious looking set. Some would say maybe the jointed wrists are the most serious looking. I, I, my favorite is the hard head set. And we'll, let's see some pictures. So here's a picture of the hard head mummy that I used to own. And you can see he has that mustard yellow head. And the distinctive thing about him is that his right arm is jointed so that it can be posed across his chest in a sling. His bandages form a sling. And this mimics the classic Karis Universal Monsters mummy pose with the arm across the chest. And here is my old hard head Azrak Hamway Wolfman. He was really cool. You can see he looks very serious, very ferocious. He has a very different looking head from all the other A High Wolfman variants. The, the rest of them, the heads all look kind of similar, but this hard head version has a very different head. It looks very different. And the most distinctive thing about him is that he has hair sculpted onto his chest, hands, and feet. So it's not just painted brown. The hair is actually sculpted into the plastic. It's molded into the plastic. None of the other ones, as far as I know, have that, except the, the jointed wrist Wolfman, but all the jointed wrist figures share the same hairy torso for some reason. Now here's the hard head Dracula. He's not my favorite Dracula. I actually prefer the colored body and painted hand variants of the, and even the Soma variant of the Dracula. The most striking thing about him is the cape, the 
the collar isn't really a collar, it's so oversized, it's more like a half cape. A half cape over his full cape, almost like an Inverness cape. Now I don't know that it's supposed to be a half cape, I think it's supposed to be a collar, but generally when you see loose examples of the Stracula, that, that collar is hanging down like a half cape. And I'm going to show you the hardhead Frankenstein in a moment. I sold those other three, even though I love those toys. I sold them many years ago. I guess it's been a decade or so. I sold them just, I needed the money, and uh, I got a lot of money for them. I, I, I got several thousand dollars each for those figures. Uh, and I had the thin waist creature to go with it on a card. And I got several thousand dollars for that. So it was, I just couldn't refuse the money. It was too much. I, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't responsibly say no. It was just, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. As my friend Andrew says, they, they priced themselves out of my collection. So it was really a shame to let those go. I wish I still had them. I'll never own those again. Those are so expensive, I'll, I'll never own that set again. And that, those are not the only other ones I had. I had some jointed wrist ones on a card. I had uh, a set that's known as the Soma set because it doesn't have, it's very similar to this set, but Frankenstein doesn't have a vest. He's just got a, he's just naked underneath his jacket. It doesn't have an AHI logo anywhere. And so that set's generally just called the Soma set. And there's a Cupped Hands series that's also probably Soma and not, not made through AHI. Um, so there's different variants. And I've never owned the Painted Hands series on, a, on cards. Um, I probably never will, but that's, I, I'm kind of interested in, in maybe acquiring some of those on cards someday. But I haven't been actively buying carded AHI monsters in a long, long, long time. They're just too expensive. They've just gone up so high in price, I just can't do it. Uh, but this series that I have, another reason why, I mean, all of mine were minty, nice condition, but these are factory fresh. I mean, they're, and I do think that the set that I have came straight out of a factory box because there is a collector out there who has a factory box of Ahi Super Monsters. And I, I think he's sold off some of them over the years, but for a long time he was only missing one set of four. And I think the ones he w was missing, that, that one set that he was missing, was the set I own. I said, because the ones he has in that box look exactly like mine. I think it's obvious that the ones I own are that missing set that, for whatever reason, he sold out of that box. Because mine are case fresh. So there's the Frankenstein Super Monster action figure. Made to compete with Mego. They were meant as essentially Mego knockoffs with the same card style that Mego was using. People think of Mego the superheroes as being sold in boxes and that was the main way they were sold, but they were also sold on those cards that are that collectors refer to as Kresge cards, whether they were actually sold at Kresge or not. Kresge was the store chain that became Kmart. And for a while there were Kresge and Kmart stores at the same time until it transitioned over to Kmart. And I do remember buying some of my Azurai Kenway Super Monsters from Kresge or Kmart. And I do have memories of seeing them on the pig hooks. I have vivid memories of buying the Tomland Monsters from Kresge. And I bought my Chemtoy Jaws Sharks from Kresge. So I have a lot of Kresge memories. I bought a lot of Imagineering and Ben Cooper stuff from Kresge, and I saw a lot of 
Top Stone Mask, the Krusky. Krusky was a big part of my childhood. But I think it was called Kmart in my neighborhood. I think my closest Kresge store, I think it was already called Kmart when I was a kid. I could be wrong about that. This is my only sealed carded hardhead as Rat Canway toy at this point. This is the only one I still have. This is the Frankenstein. And he's a very serious looking Frankenstein. And this is my favorite Frankenstein of the series. Of all the variants, this is my favorite one. And it looks very much like Boris Karloff. The head's obviously molded off of the Aurora model kit. And the Aurora kit, it's, it's kind of a hybrid of Karloff and Glenn Strange, but it's more Karloff than anything else. The artwork on, on the box might have been, well, kind of sort of Glenn Strange, maybe. But the model itself, the sculpt, is definitely Karloff. And he's, in fact, it's Bride of Frankenstein Karloff, particularly. But some people say they see a little bit of Glenn Strange in there, too. So, yeah, maybe, maybe. But I think it's more Karloff than anything else. And this head is just taken off the Aurora kit. So it's basically the Aurora Frankenstein as an action figure. And he has hands molded in green, much like that other Frankenstein we just saw. But the rest of his body is tan. The only parts that are green are the forearms. And they're molded so that these hands are, the back of the hands are facing forward. So if you pose his arms up, he's got that sleepwalking position, you know, like that. His hands can't move to the side. They, they, they're like this. And that started with Bela Lugosi's interpretation of the monster in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. That's why he, he, he he's, ever since then, he's been depicted as walking with his hands outstretched like that because Bela's monster was supposed to be blind and was trying to feel his way around. You couldn't see. But then Glenn Strange picked that up in House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, Evan Gastelum, Frankenstein, and it just stuck ever since. When you think of the Frankenstein's monster, you think of him holding his arms out in front of him. And the reason I didn't sell this one, besides the fact that he's He's a favorite of mine. I mean, they were all favorites. The Mummy was a favorite, too. He's, his seal was compromised. I don't think you can see it. No, you're not. You can't, you're not going to be able to see it on camera, I don't think. But take my word for it. Someone tried to open a corner, and you can see that the paper is a little bit torn in one spot and then it's clear that they, they stopped and then glued it back down. So because it's not perfect, you know, perfectly sealed all the way, there's a bit of a reseal in one spot. That's why I knew if I sold him I wasn't going to get full value for him because of that. Although now I, I don't think anyone would care. Now I think the market's changed and Frankenstein's, where the bubble's practically falling off, are, are selling for $1,000 sometimes. So I, I think the market's, well, the market goes up and down, but it seems like people have gotten a lot less picky about the condition of these in recent years. So I don't think it would make much of a difference now. But at that time, uh, the ones I was selling were just impeccable. And this one had that little flaw, and so I... I I said, well, I, he's my favorite anyway, so I, I held him back. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I still have him. He's something. Easily one of the best Frankenstein toys of all time. In my book, anyway. Really cool. Very serious, very gothic. Just a good old scary looking Frankenstein that looks like Frankenstein ought to look. 
And on the back, he has that full-sized picture, unlike the other ones. He has this, the, the, the image fills the entire back of the card. You can really see it in detail. And this is based on the Aurora James Bama art. And James Bama used a still from the original Frankenstein that showed some test makeup that was never in the movie. So that face is, I think, I think there is a still. I don't know which Frankenstein actor is in that still, but I think this is based on a particular still, the whole, the whole pose, except for that detail of the forehead, which is based on the image from the original Frankenstein showing the test makeup. So this, this is just a classic toy. I mean, you can't really see it with the stuff in front of it, can you? This is just a classic toy, classic Frankenstein toy, one of the most classic Frankenstein action figures of all time. Maybe the most classic Frankenstein action figure of all time, certainly, you know, with Mego style figures. I know the Remco one, has a lot of fans, and I know there's been recent ones like the NECA or the Sideshow, the, but I really like this particular Frankenstein. I think there's some magic with this particular one that just nails it. It's, it's serious and realistic looking. It's scary looking. It's authentic to the, the likeness of Boris Karloff. It's licensed by Universal Studios, but it's still very, very much a toy. It's a toy that you'd play with. It's not a. It's not for adult collectors. It's a toy. So I really like this particular Frankenstein. Okay, let's. I haven't said okay as much this episode, have I? I think I've been pretty good about that. Let's put him back in here. Which one is this? This is Dracula. Count Dracula. There's Count Dracula. He's a little disheveled in his in his bubble there. He's got a bit of a gray look. He's had that since ever since I've owned him, and it hasn't changed. But uh, I kind of, you know, for a while I wanted to replace this one just because he, just the way he looks on the bubble. I mean, he's mint, he's sealed, everything, but he's untouched. But just the way he's, he looks kind of jumbled in there. It'd be nice to have one that was like facing forward and was a little more. Uh, refined, but you know that's the way package toys are. Sometimes they look like that. And he's obviously based on the Aurora Dracula model kit, which I think some people don't think it looks at all like Bela. I mean, it's obviously it's not a exact likeness of Bela Lugosi, and. Um, at that point, I don't know if Aurora was deliberately trying to not look like Lugosi. The artwork on the box certainly looks like Lugosi. But I think that for a Lugosi-style Dracula, this looks pretty good. As I said before, I have seen official Lugosi-licensed Dracula products that didn't look as much like Lugosi as this. So is it... Uh, NECA quality. Is it, is it NECA quality Lugosi? No. Is it caustic plastic quality? No. But it's, for its era, I think it's pretty good. And you can see he's got the red, or kind of orange, orange red arms, and his whole, his whole body is that color same color as his head. I think they did a pretty good job of matching the color of the, the soft PVC head with the plastic body. The, the colors match pretty well on all these. 
and he's got this image of Dracula behind him, which you can't see very well. Now this one is not as perfect as the rest, because I see this bubble has a little ding. You see the bubble has some dings there. And I did, I bought the other three Frankenstein, Mummy, Wolfman at the same time from the same person, and then I bought this Dracula soon after. So although I still, I, I maintain that this Dracula probably did come from the same box as those other three, but it might have bounced around for a little bit before it got to me, whereas the other three, I think, went directly to me. Or maybe they went from the original owner to someone to me. And I think he made this one might have bounced around a little and ended, that's why he's got a couple of dings. But I think all of these came from the same box originally. And the others have a Universal Studios copyright. This Dracula does not. None of the Draculas do. Here's the back. And that hardhead one that I showed you the picture of it would have had a, a image that filled the entire back. And you can see that's clearly Lugosi. I love this impressionistic background. What is that? Is it a castle or trees or what is, what's back there? And even the moon is very impressionistic. Very moody. So a little kid looking at this definitely you know, it would give them a certain vibe of the, and kind of tell them how to play with this toy. That when you play with this toy, this is going to be a spooky, spooky toy, and you're going to have a oh, a moody atmosphere when, when this toy arrives on the scene. It's not going to be like the Adam West Batman show with kapow, kablam. This is going to be eerie and spooky. And I don't remember as a kid if I had, I think I had this version. I think I had the version with the orange body. I'm pretty sure. Reddish orange body. I remember I was at a, a car dealership. My mom and dad were shopping for a car and I brought my Dracula with me. And so I had him in my hand. And I remember they were, it was at night and they were looking at a car in the lot and the salesman looked at this Dracula and he said, is that a magician? He thought it was a toy magician. I said, no, that's not a magician, that's Dracula. I don't know if he knew what Dracula was. I remember having to explain to him what Dracula was. It kind of reminds me when I bought the Imperial Dracula on a card from Toys R Us. This is when they were still in the stores. This is, now I'm an adult collector buying this Imperial carded Dracula. I took him up to the checkout lane and there was this little kid, I mean, this little, little, little kid who was all excited about this, seeing me buying this Dracula. He was like, Mom, 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 look at that. And he said, that's Count Dracula. He emphasized the count. He said that repeatedly, it's Count Dracula, Count Dracula. And mom, his mom was like, okay, that's nice, dear. But he was all excited because I was buying this Count Dracula figure. And they emphasize the Count Dracula there. And again, I think that's got something to do with the Universal license. The fact that this is not licensed by Universal because just plain old Dracula is the Universal film and the Lugosi character. Um, so I think by calling him Count Dracula, they're suggesting that it's the literary character.
Ooh. Well, here is the mummy. These cases were custom made in Mexico before it was common to have cases like these. This is not AFA graded. I, I don't do that. I would never do that. I'm not down with that. The mummy is easily one of my favorite Azrak Hamway characters, the way they depict him. All of their mummy action figures have yellow heads and that blue eye with blood. They all have yellow heads. This one does not have the arm going across the chest like the hard head version. And I, I should have pointed out the hard head versions, the, the, the heads are hard, you can't, you can't squeeze them. These have soft heads, you can squeeze these. And as far as I know, all the other AHI variants have soft, squishy heads, but not the hard head versions. And the hard head ones have a different body. Well, there's many different bodies for AHI, but these have snapped together joints, and the hard head ones, like that Frankenstein, have riveted joints and uh, the torso is jointed at a weird angle. There's a lot of differences between the hardhead versions and the, all the other versions. And you can see he's got yellow hands. His, his entire body is yellow. Not just his hands, all, all of him. His entire body is yellow. And like most of the high mummies, he's got white shoes. The hardhead one has Frankenstein-style boots, big, big old white boots, but they're white. Most of the other one, mummies have slippers like this one. And then the Soma mummy doesn't have any shoes or slippers or anything. I like that he has like a little pot belly. I think that's because he's got like a diaper under the bandages. He's really cute. Not a lot of blood on this one. It's kind of light on the blood with this particular one. And you can see that it's a, it's a very minty card, unpunched. Now there's a ding though, look at that. There's a ding on the bubble. Here's the back of the card. I don't remember these bubble dings. <laughs> Every time I look at these, I, there's something about the condition that I noticed that I never noticed before. It seems like the condition degrades each time I look at it. But years will pass between looking at these toys. That is obviously based on the Aurora Glowcat art, and you can see how he's yellow because he's supposed to be glowing in the dark. He's Blue, blue bandages and yellow details, yellow head and hands and yellow bandages, like these featured bandages hanging off them, and blood on the, on the hands and the chest. And these toys do not glow in the dark. I don't think any of the Azrak Hamway monster toys glow in the dark. But this artwork depicts a glow in the dark mummy. That's why he's yellow, he's glowing in the dark, that the Aurora kids glowed in the dark. And so because of that, since all the Aurora artwork in the 70s had that yellow glow art, I wonder why they didn't make all of these toys with yellow heads like that. Why'd they choose the mummy? Well, I guess he is, in, on the Aurora box art, he is probably the most striking in the way that he has that yellow look. Ah! Alright, 
we got one more before we get to the creatures. Oh, here's the wolf man. Yeah, he's got a couple of uh, bubble dings too. I didn't notice those dings before. But the you can see the card is just beautiful. I mean, that, it's a spectacular card. But he has a couple dings in the same spots up there at the bubble. Look at that. Look at that. Is he focused? I don't know. He looks a little blurry. Clearly based on the Aurora model kit. Unlike the Bendems and the Rubber Jiggler, this Wolfman has a shirt. And this concept of this, almost like this pajama-like costume would carry over to the Lincoln Wolfman and the Remco Wolfman. But the Bendham's Wolfman and the Jiggler, they, they do not have clothes like that. So it's interesting they didn't, uh, they probably thought about just making him topless like the Aurora kit, but they, I guess they thought that looked like an incomplete toy. Even the hairy uh, hardhead version with the hairy chest, even that has a shirt like this and a yarn belt. It's supposed to be a rope belt. He's got a brown body. You can really see the fact that the entire body is brown on this one. And it's a very deep chocolate brown, darker than the brown of his head. And there's the Aurora style art copied off the Aurora model kits with the yellow head and yellow hands signifying that he's supposed to be glowing in the dark. Now he's got boots in this picture. I wonder if they ever considered giving the toy boots. Wouldn't that be something if they made all these figures with these yellow heads like that? I wonder if that was ever considered. And this was back in the days when Wolfman was spelled as one word. All Wolfman toys spelled it as one word. And it's not the Wolfman, it's just Wolfman. He's a pretty cute Wolfman. As a kid, I... The, the, I don't know if I had this version or not, or if I might have had the painted hands version, but the one I had as a kid it had a marbled look to the plastic. It was like the brown didn't quite mix, so it was sort of marbled all over. The, the, the brown it had a kind of marbled look, like the, the brown dye didn't completely mix with the plastic. And I remember, I remember being fascinated by that. So it was, it was probably the brown body version that I had as a kid, but for whatever reason, the, the dye didn't quite take and had that kind of weird marbled look all through the body. And I've never seen one as a collector like that. But I remember being fascinated by that marbled look to the, the plastic. And it was all over. It was his hands, his body, everything was like that. Okay, so... I guess that brings us to the creatures. Now I used to have, along with that hard head set, I had a hard head, I've had two carded 
thin waist creatures. And in the 90s, we called these the female creatures. So this was the male creature. And then the other version was the female creature. And for years, that's what collectors, and this, this is how they refer to them. And uh, today, the preference is to call them the wide waist and the thin waist. And you know, I think calling them male and female is cute. It's fun. Again, this is supposed to be fun. I like cute nicknames like A high instead of A H I or male and female, even though we know they're both the creature from the movie. They're both male. But it just it's cute when you're when you collect something. I think in most collecting fields they develop nicknames and in kind of fun lingo. But thin waist and wide waist is uh you know, it's more accurate that they're both male. It's just the one is sculpted with a thin waist and wide hips, and the other is, it's like a bulldog of a creature. It's all thick all over. So here is the thin waist creature. Now this is the only reproduction card you're gonna see. This is a reproduction card. And it just seemed like, since they, I, I actually already had this card when I obtained this creature, so it seemed like the best way to store it. Why not? I've got this card. And it's protected it very nicely all these years. But I've had two genuine carded thin waist creatures. One had a bubble that was very damaged, so you could take it out of the bubble. The other one... It, bubble was also damaged on that one, but not to the point where you could remove it from the bubble. So that one, the toy inside the bubble was untouched. And uh, that's the one I sold when I sold those other hard head figures. I sold that one. This is the nicest cre thin waist creature figure I've ever seen. You can see there that there's virtually no paint wear on this thing. This, I believe, the, the owner before me took this off a card. This was on a card, and I think he removed it himself from a card because whatever, the card wasn't in good condition or whatever. And he just figured he might as well have it loose instead. But it, it was untouched, and it's still perfect. There's just no paint wear at all on this creature. And if you know anything about these toys, you know that's just unheard of. They've all got paint wear. Even the two carded ones I had, the, the first one with the more damaged bubble, it had paint wear. Uh, the other one that had never been out of that bubble, as far as I know, it only had just a tiny, tiny little, yeah, a few little scratches, I think, on the feet somewhere from coming in contact with the bubble. But this one has no scratches. and This is just perfect. So that's the most perfect one I've ever seen. Very hard to get a thin waist creature in this condition. Not many of them out there like this. And you'd almost have to have a perfectly sealed carded one to find it in this condition. To find one that's not sealed in a bubble but looks like this, I don't know how you do that. Because as soon as you start handling these, the paint just comes right off. And if you pose it at all, the paint comes off at the joints. Now as a child, I never saw this version. I didn't know this existed until I was an adult. This is probably the first one they made. Well, I don't know. I mean, common thinking now is that this came first and the wide waist, wide waist version came second. But I'm not sure about that because if you look at the catalogs, it shows, well, it shows, it really shows a, a prototype made from an, an Aurora kit where they kit bashed 
the actual model kit and made it look like an action figure. But that's what this looks like. So it, it, it looks more like this. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's, you know, it's debatable. No one's really sure what came first, what came second, what came third, what came first. Or maybe they were all, they were all made at the same time. Now they were all made by Soma, but Soma probably had different factories, different locations around Hong Kong. And they probably used, it was probably an all hands on deck situation when they got this license. And they probably had all the factories working on it. And I bet each factory had a different team and the result was a different set of toys. The, the, the toys that came out of each factory looked different. Some looked all very different from others. And in some cases, they might have had a body style that was already available that they used at one factory that was different from what they used at another. Just speculation. But this, these creatures had to be built from the bottom up. I mean, they had to make these from scratch. So it's strange that they made them so different. Here is the wide waist creature. Still in one piece. Every time I look at this, I think he's gonna fall apart. There is a genuine carded, sealed, wide waist creature from the Black Lagoon. Azrak Hanway International. Sealed, real card, genuine, real deal. That is the wide waist creature. And you can see that the card looks a lot like the colored body style, but actually it's this card. There, there, there. Even with the same light waste creature, there's more than one card that we've seen. Some have bubbles that are bigger than others, but the, the thing about this one, I, th it's the white border around the edge. I think that um, other ones out there have a art that extends all the way to the edge. I think there's examples like that. And obviously it doesn't have that small image like the colored body cards. So this, this version with this white border looks most, looks like the, um, the jointed wrist variant, that, that card style. So this is probably, this probably corresponds to the jointed wrist series. Even though the, really except for that white border, it looks almost identical to the colored body versions. And I think, I think this, this white waist style creature is the one that would correspond to the colored body figures. Whether the card, whether there are creature cards or were creature cards that didn't have the white borders on the back, I don't know. There are creatures that have heads molded in tan and creatures that have heads molded in green. And I think this is one with a head molded in green. I know my childhood one definitely has a molded green head, but there are some that are molded in tan and then painted green. I've seen, there, like I said, there are different bubble variants there are carded creatures out there that have much bigger bubbles than this. Bubbles that are wider, bubbles that stick out farther. He's a little cramped in this bubble, which is why I'm always afraid he's gonna pop apart in there. So there are definitely variants and it's hard to tell. And I don't think that you can precisely connect these creatures to these different variant sets like the painted 
hands or the jointed wrists or the hard heads or the colored bodies or the cupped hands or the soma. I think it's a little more complicated than that because I remember these creatures very well as a child. I saw on the cards that there was a creature. So I saw those other characters before I saw the creature. And for a long time, months, um, I was waiting for the creature to come out. And I'd already gone through the other four characters, the Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, Mummy. I'd already played those into the ground. I don't even know if I still had those or if they were probably were pieces because I would play with the mummy in the sandbox and I would have him come up out of the sand like he's coming out of the desert. And of course his bandages, it's just the first few times I played with them, the bandages would all become unwound and I tried to get my dad to wrap them up again. It was a mess. And they all kind of fell apart. Um, I, I played with them a lot. But I think there was a good year that I was playing with those things. And I was pretty young when I got these. So I wasn't very careful with the toys, the way I was playing with my toys. Things I had a little later, like when, you know, like Six Million Dollar Man and Star Wars and all that, you know, that later 70s stuff, a lot of that I still have because I was a little older and I was playing with it much more carefully. But these, I was still at the stage where I was practically eating my toys. I was so young, I would just destroy my toys as I was playing with them. Now, I don't know if I still had the other four by the time the creature came out. I think there was a, like a year between getting the first of those, and I think Frankenstein was the first one I got, and then finally getting a creature. And I was aware of him and I was watching for the creature to finally hit the store. And I remember going to Kmart and saying, oh, do they have any creatures? Do they have any creatures? And looking through the super monsters, no creature. And wondering if they were ever going to come out with that creature. And I mean, I've had that experience with, with other toys. I remember, people don't talk about this now, but with the Star Wars figures, the Jawa, was really hard to find. I never saw a vinyl Cape Jawa in a store, but the other 11 figures were out for months before anyone I knew ever saw a Jawa. And every time we go to the store, like, where's the Jawa, where's the Jawa? Finally, they had the Jawa. And he had the cloth cloak. And I remember with The Empire Strikes Back, it was like that with Yoda, we were always, Where's Yoda? We're waiting for Yoda to come out. And then finally when Yoda came out, it was just nothing but Yodas on the pig hooks. And that's the way it was with this creature. I kept waiting for the creature to come out, checking all the time. Every time my parents took me to Kmart, where's the creature? Where's the creature? And then one, it was never there. And then one day, it was nothing but creatures. Just There were no other characters. It was just creature, creature, creature filling the pick hooks. And it was this creature. I never saw that thin waist creature at the store. I only saw this wide waist one. And it was like they had gotten a shipment of just creatures. So that's why I wonder about the way these were distributed. I wonder if the creature was sort of separate, like its own assortment, and, and not packed with the other characters. I wonder if they didn't just ship boxes of just the creature. So I don't know if you can link the creature specifically to all these other variants. Maybe, maybe if I had a dozen carded creatures, I, I could say, okay, this card goes with this variant set and this card goes with this variant set, but they're so rare, you just don't see that many out there. And I've probably seen photos of every one that's known to exist but it's, it's just a confusing, dizzying mess trying to figure out what goes to what. I think it's ultimately pointless that, I mean, it's, it's interesting to, for collectors to speculate about it, but um, trying to match all these up, you're gonna, you're gonna spend a lot of years and a lot of money trying to 
match all these variants together in sets. And I, th I think, I think that it's really, it was just a matter of Soma having different factories and each factory made things a little bit differently for whatever reason. I don't think there was any thought behind it like um, someone sitting at a, in a boardroom at Azra Hanway saying, we're going to change the heads on, on this series or we're going to change the cards slightly. I don't, I don't think it was like that. I think it was just random different crews at these different factories had different ways of assembling these materials and, and putting, and for whatever reason, I mean, this is pre-computer age, they couldn't just send like a file to all the factories and have everything identical. They had to sort of start from scratch at each factory, I'm, I'm guessing, with the printing plates and the molds and everything, to have it all running at the same time. This is just speculation. That's the only thing really that would account for why there's so many different variations. If they were using different factories and each factory at the same time and each factory had a different way of doing things. That's just speculation. There's, collectors speculate a lot about this and there really is no good answer. That issue of Toy Ventures is probably the closest you're going to get to finding any answers. There is one of the holy grails of monster collecting, holy grails of action figure collecting. One of the rarest, most sought after 70s action figures. The wide waist Azrak Hanway International Creature from the Black Lagoon. Huh. What do you know? I bought this in 1993. I started collecting in 89, and it was really in inspired by this toy, my childhood creature, to delve into the wider world of collecting. And one of my goals was to get a carded version of him, not knowing how rare or difficult that would be. And really the whole journey of collecting was a process of doing, taking the steps necessary to get to the point where I would be able, where I would be in a position to be able to get this. I couldn't just step off the bus uh, as a first day toy collector and obtain this. I had to go on a journey from 89 to 93 to get to the point where I could get one of these. But still, that's a short time. That's four years. Yeah, it's surprising that I was able to get it that quickly. But I really, I went for it. I was laser focused on, this was my goal, to get this thing. So I got it, and I've had it ever since. Long time, 1993. So I, I, I'm assuming I bought I probably got this in 74. Um, probably, and if I do that column I mentioned, that would be in the column. I have a photo of opening this toy. I have a photo. I'm not going to show it now because I, if I do this column, I want to save it for that. I've posted it before, though. I have a photo of the day I got this and opened the bubble and it shows the bubble sitting there opened and me holding this in my hand and it looks like it's probably Christmas but I have conflicting memories um, I'm sure that this is the second one I got that the first one I got as soon as I took it out of the bubble I moved his arm I think it was um, I don't I don't know I think it's probably his right arm I think I moved his right arm and it just popped off. And I was ah, crying. 
And my memory is that my dad right away went to the store and returned it and got another one and came back with this one that I've had ever since. But that photo doesn't really match that memory. So I don't know if there's some false memories here or what exactly is going on. But that photo doesn't quite match my memory of, of how I got this. But in that photo, it, I think it is 1974. It's not dated, but um, there's a G.I. Joe in the photo, and someone else told me that's probably 74 based on the when that G.I. Joe came out. So it was probably like the toys had probably been out for one year. And um, if it was Christmas, then it was the end of the year. So it's probably some months had gone by getting the other ones. And then finally got this one. Um, so let's say 74, if I had it that long. How many years is that? Well, that's only, gosh, what is that, 19 years between getting this and getting this. It, compared to how old I am now, it's been 30, 31 years since I bought this. So I've had this 31 years. And it was only the 19 years before this, before this one, that I got that one. So it's less than 20 years separating these two. That's a long time. Yep. <laughs> wow. So that, and that, yeah, I was pretty young when I got this. So, boy, basically, yeah, your, your childhood toys are always going to be special because they're your childhood toys. But in terms of how long I've had these things, it's getting to the point where it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. You know, is it, so I've had one 50 years versus 30-something years, whatever. I mean, I've had them both a long time. Uh... And I was young when I got this. I was a child when I got this, but I was young when I got this. So I was young when I got both of these things. And it's getting to the point where there's just not a lot of difference in terms of uh, what they mean to me as far as their place in my life. I've had them both most of my life at this point. And I have, I've had them both since I was young. Younger in this case, but still young when I got this. So there, obviously this is a childhood heirloom, but this has become something of an heirloom because I've had, I've had it so long. So I can't really see, I certainly would never sell that, but I can't even see selling this. I'd have to really have the wolf at my door, the wolf man scratching at my door to, I have to be in dire straits. I mean, you just don't come across stuff like that every day. So if you're lucky enough to own something like that, you don't just give it away. But I will probably be buried with that creature because it has, they both have sentimental value. And, you know, they both mean something to me. So I, I don't think I would sell either one. I know I obviously wouldn't sell my childhood one, but I don't think I would even sell the, the carded one. If the wolf were at the door, maybe the rest of these would go, but not that one. That would be the, the very last thing in the world I'd ever let go of. <sighs> well, I mean, really, my collecting journey is all wrapped up in that, that one toy, that my, sort of my identity as a collector is very much embodied within that toy.
for a variety of reasons. I remember... Well, now this is weird. I've got that creature, that carded creature, shortly before my grandfather died. It was the same year, 93. And I hadn't had it that long when he died. And I remember, very oddly, I remember when, when he died, um, I went to my grandparents' house. Uh, my grandmother had, you know, obviously called the police, and the police were there, and the coroner was there, paramedics. He had died of natural causes. We, it was not a surprise. We had expected he had been sick for some time, and we knew his time was drawing near, so although it was sad and tragic, we knew that he was not long for this world. So we went to the house, my grandparents' house, and my grandfather was slumped in his favorite chair, the one that would face the TV. And I remember when I saw him, the position of his body was exactly like that carded creature on the, in the bubble. The, his limbs and everything was, was exactly that position. And I remember when I looked at him, that thought crossed my mind. It was weird. And I, I, I wondered if there was some karmic something going on, some weird... This was before the movie The Matrix, but in modern parlance, you might say some glitch in The Matrix, something some weird connection happening in reality, in the multiverse, who knows. But it just has that added little you know, resonance because of that. So that's a kind of a spooky, weird little, oh, uh, not really, a, I guess an anecdote. Here we go, here's the Colored Body series, Azrak Hanway Monsters. This is what it all leads up to, all this Ahai collecting. These are the premier elements. Now, would something like the water pistols be more rare? Yes, like the creature water pistol, of course, it's much more rare. You know, there. But, but the heart of the Azrak Hanway Super Monster collection would be the action figures. They're the, you know, they're the centerpiece of the whole thing. If these action figures didn't exist, I don't know that people would be as interested in the in the universe of Azrak Hanway monsters. It, it all really, and these are the anchors that that hold it all together. This is the, the centerpiece of that universe, the, the action figure series on these beautiful pink cards. These strange little pink cards. They also made, oh, they made other stuff. They made flashlights. I've never, as I had them as a kid. I had the flashlights as a kid. I've never had the flashlights as a collector, but they made a Frankenstein and a Wolfman flashlight. They, those were among the final things that Azra can we put out. The car design is different. They look very different than, they don't really have the same castle. They have a castle on it, but it doesn't look the same. So those were among the very last things that came out. Oh, what else? What else did they make? Oh, I'm sure I'm forgetting things, but that's enough, I guess. We've exhausted this, this topic. It's very important to me. Uh, the Super Monsters line was important to me in childhood, and it's important as a collector now. It's important, I think, that I always have these in my collection. I feel like if I ever let go of these, I mean, I let go of a lot of them. I had a, a lot more than this. But if I ever let go of the very last few that I have, then I feel like I might as well just sell everything else. That, that's like the last thing holding it all together. 
and if I don't have the, if I don't have these, then what's the point? Maybe I might as well just sell everything else. So these are important. I don't know if I'll ever build back my carded a high figure collection. Probably not. Might I someday get another one or two? Maybe. But I'm never going to have the vast collection I used to have with all those variants on cards. <sighs> but it would, be it would be nice to buy another carded a high one day. I haven't done that in a long time. It would be nice to, to just experience buying another one. I don't know. If I could rebuy just one of the ones that I, I sold, I think it would be the hardhead mummy with the hand across the chest. I think that's the, the one I'd want to buy back if I could buy one. And if I could buy two, then I guess it'd be the wolf man with the hairy chest. And I don't know that there's really any others that I have a burning desire at this point in my life to buy back because, you know, I'm getting older and I can't take this stuff with me. So it's getting less and less important to acquire this stuff because, you know, you can't, can't be buried with it. And I'm a lot closer to being buried than I am to the time when I had this thing. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's fewer years between now and the grave than between now and when I had this. So I'm, I'm seeing that arc of my life. Like, I, it's pretty clear where it's heading. And it's not, not to Toyland. It's to the big dirt nap. So on that happy note, I think we'll say goodbye. <sighs> and that's a pro these, this, 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 these are monsters. This is not happy time. This is monster time. We're here for monsters and horror and scary, bad dreams. If you're a monster fan, then bad dreams are good dreams. I'll come back with one more episode and we'll look at the Remco monsters. And that will be it. It'll probably be a lot shorter than this, I hope. So until then, thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. I rarely ask you to subscribe. If you've stuck it out this long, watching this, this episode, then you must like this stuff. So if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, please. And until next time, the one who dies with the most toys is dead.